Welcome to the launch of the special issue of the Australian Journal of Environmental Education on School Strikes for Climate. My name is Dr. Peter White. I'm the current Editor-in-Chief for AJEE, the Australian Journal of Environmental Education. As we begin today in the spirit of reconciliation, acknowledging the various lands on which we gather. I'd like to pay respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, elders, past, present and emerging. We appreciate their continued relationship with country and acknowledge their continued and gracious invitation to connect with the land, air, water, and all beings. Regeneration time is imperative as we all learn to become family with place. The Australian Journal for Environmental Education is one of the oldest environmental education journals internationally. Our journal began with humble roots as an important part of the member benefit for uh, Australian, sorry, Australian Association of Environmental Education members. Our journal is now hosted by Cambridge University Press, a relationship we are very proud of. I welcome ja Jamie Davidson to our launch today. He's our Cambridge University Press editor. I would also like to acknowledge other partners in our evening today. Um, I would like to, of course, mention the Australian Association for Environmental Education. We're very pleased to have a close and very uh, friendly and happy relationship uh, between our two great organisations. Deakin University, but especially to the Sydney Environment Institute and particularly Genevieve Wright for event management. A special issue is an important contribution made by academic, academic journals to our field, environmental education. This special issue in particular is important because we are in such troubled times and experiencing uncertain futures. And it's a great opportunity to work together, to collaborate, to explore the ideas around how education and in particular environmental education can provide a leadership and insight to useful ways forward. I would I like to extend a special thanks to the co-guest editors, Blanche and Alicia, for the work that they've been contributing over the last two years to bring this special issue into its fullness. Their generosity and commitment to create not only a fabulous special issue, but as we see here today, a community of researchers is commendable and we appreciate you and thank you very much. And over to you, thanks for organizing today. Thanks so much, Peter, and hi, everyone. My name is Blanche Burley. I'm a researcher at the Sydney Environment Institute and one of the co-guest editors of this special issue of the Australian Journal of Environmental Education on the School Strikes for Climate, uh, along with Alicia. I completed my PhD in climate change education while teaching climate change to undergraduate students in Melbourne, and now I'm at, at the Sydney Environment Institute. Thanks, Peter and Blanche. Uh, it is an honour to have co-guest edited this special issue over the last couple of years with their very excellent Blanche and with the incredible support of Peter. Um, I'm completing, I'm in the final stages of my PhD research in anti-colonial climate and place responsive learning based on field work with a high school in inner city Nam, Melbourne. I'm a also a teacher educator currently teaching environmental sustainability and climate change as well as critical pedagogies at the University of Melbourne. And I've been a school teacher, community educator and long-term climate and social justice activist, as well as a mother of two climate strikers. Before we begin, Alicia and I would also like to acknowledge uh, where we've conducted our work from. So this special issue was edited on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation and of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. As white settlers, we honour the care First Nations people have given to this land for at least 60,000 years and continue to give. We offer our deepest respects and gratitude to the elders of the Kulin Nation and Eora Nation past and present, and we extend our respect to all First Nations people. We would also like to especially acknowledge that Indigenous young people have been leading climate justice activism in many guises around the world for decades. 
We'd also like to thank Peter White and the Australian Journal of Environmental Education team, uh, especially Amy Cutter Mackenzie Knowles, Hilary Whitehouse, and Sandra Wilthorton for supporting the development of this special issue. And of course, we'd like to thank our contributing authors, who I'm going to ask to turn on their camera and give you a wave right now. Uh, so in no particular order, and including some who could not make it tonight for various reasons, uh, Amanda Tattersall, Jean Hinchcliffe, Basha Yajman, Peter White, Joe Ferguson, Neve O'Connor-Smith, Harriet O'Shea-Carr, Nita Alexander, Teresa Petre, Ailey McDowell, Rhea Bright, Chris Eames, Hannah Feldman, Emma Keach, Jaden Malashichuk, Greg Lowen Trudeau, Teresa Ann Fowler, Karina Menzi Valentine, Miriam Hamm, Benjamin Bowman, and Chloe Germain. Okay, folks, so just a very brief overview of our special issue launch party today. Uh, so, in this launch party for the special issue on the school climate strikes, uh, Blanche and I will firstly provide an introduction to the research collection. Uh, we then have a video to share with you that's made up of compositions um, made by all the authorial teams in this special issue, speaking about each of their papers. Blanche and I will then speak with two of those uh, authorial teams that include school strike leaders, Jean, Neve, Harriet and Varsha as co-authors about their experiences and insights through uh, the creation of this special issue. We'll then move to a general Q&A session uh, with questions coming from the audience. So hopefully that includes you. And uh, they may be directed to a particular author or perhaps to the whole panel. So feel free to post questions in the Q&A box as we go, or you can raise your hand during the Q&A session when we get there and we'll be able to unmute you so that you can ask your question. Excellent. So the decision to put together this special issue happened uh, after attending school strikes with our students and children in 2018 and 2019, and in the aftermath of the Black Summer bushfires in Australia. Attending the strikes forced us to question the frequent positioning of education as a solution to climate change. Of concern to Blanche and I was the reality that students were walking away from school literally and symbolically. One often used school striker placard reads, we're skipping our lessons to give you one. And Greta Thunberg and peers argue that striking is the biggest lesson of all. Listening to young people's words and actions regarding the value of schooling and what counts as climate education raised the question in the context of the escalating global crises of climate change and mass biodiversity extinction, is school education in its current form fit for purpose? At the, start of the, at the start of 2020, just as the COVID-19 pandemic was unfolding, we placed the call for submissions for this special issue to provide a space to closely consider the educational dimensions of the school strikes. Central to our concerns was the persistent and pervasive dismissal of children's climate knowledge and political agency perpetuated in some climate change education research, commonly apparent in deficit-based studies that seek to quantify students' lack of knowledge, concern and or action. We specified in the call for papers that we were primarily interested in research that emphasised young people's sophisticated and nuanced abilities as informed and agile social activists. Uh, so for a very brief summary of the articles, uh, the resulting special issue contains 10 excellent research papers. Represented among the authors are school students, honours students, master's students, PhD students and early career researchers, as well as more established scholars. These pieces represent authors from Australia, Aotearoa, New Zealand, Canada and the United Kingdom. We believe this research, thanks to its rigorous reflection on students' experiences of climate education and activism, and its interrogation of the role, responsibilities, and possibilities of formal education, can help us all, whatever our age or role in society, to contribute to intergenerational climate justice, specifically through transforming education. So before we move on to hearing from the authors, uh, Alicia and I are just going to reflect on some of the key themes that have come out of the papers in this research collection. So one of the most significant themes of this collection is the affective dimensions of climate justice. Okay. Students are striking because they're terrified of the future they're inheriting and horrified by the unequal implications for others, human and non-human, around the world. 
A second theme is that strikers learn through their participation in striking, which is often in contrast to the insufficient climate change education taught in schools. Research published in this issue shows how young people are learning a dynamic suite of skills and critically applied knowledge when striking from school. That is, striking is itself educational. A third theme across the articles is that young people are becoming climate change educators. So not only have the young strikers been learning, they've also been teaching themselves and others, their peers, parents, teachers, communities, politicians, and scholars like ourselves. Striking from school doesn't mean young people are rejecting education, but rather that students are leaving schools where they're not learning what they need and are teaching themselves outside of school. A fourth matter addressed in this issue is the complex political terrain that school strikers navigate in order to fight for their futures. All climate activists are faced with the pervasive petro-industrial complex of colonial capitalism. However, youth climate activists face additional political structures that inhibit their democratic participation, further amplified when their roles as school students are added into the mix. The fifth and final major theme across the papers is a call to reimagine education in diverse ways, such that fighting for planetary survival becomes a foundational aim of education. Okay. So they are uh, some of the major themes, but for some of the specific ideas in uh, the author's own papers, we're now going to show a video presentation of these articles. My name is Rhea Bright and I'm a doctoral student at Waikato University in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Myself and Chris Eames authored this paper and we explored the experiences of climate strike leaders in Aotearoa, New Zealand, looking at the motivational factors behind the strike leaders' action, actions and asking what pedagogical insights may be gained. So we interviewed climate strike leaders from diverse communities and the participants reported a turbulent journey from apathy through anxiety to action. But interestingly, they said that anxiety was a critical phase of their journey. And this has implications for classroom education because climate anxiety is often considered a barrier to climate change education. But many of the students said that if you try to avoid the anxiety felt from climate change, you don't really understand the complexities of climate change. So using Bowler's pedagogy of discomfort, we examined how these emotional stages can either disable, but more importantly, enable action. We hope you find it a worthwhile read. Kia ora koutou. My name is Jaden Walasichuk and I'm speaking to you today from Treaty 1 Territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. The research that I completed on the climate strikers was for my master's degree through the University of Guelph in Guelph, Ontario. In my research, I examined the understandings and definitions of climate justice from the perspective of climate strike organizers from all across Canada and the ways in which climate justice is represented and communicated from the Canadian National Organizing Body. Throughout my research, I conducted 17 semi-structured interviews with climate strike organizers from 10 cities across Canada, and I analyzed the Climate Strike Canada Instagram page. The initial findings of the research showed four primary pillars to the strikers' understandings of climate justice. These were Indigenous sovereignty, racial justice, economic justice, and social justice. In addition, other key findings included that the climate strikers are highly motivated by their emotions, that they are using social media as a tool in their movement, their identities are impacting their personal experiences in climate striking, and the strikers' actions and goals are highly focused on future generations. In my thesis, I argued that the climate justice that's shown by the strikers is emotional, action-oriented, and it is grounded in place and time. These findings revealed the ways in which climate strikers define, practice, and ground their climate justice through everyday actions in the climate strike movement. Hello everyone, I'm Nita Alexander. I was excited to be able to publish in this special issue journal because at the time I had completed my honours thesis 
on the school strikes for climate and it seemed like an opportunity not to be missed. This paper was co-authored with Associate Professor Teresa Petray and Dr Ailey McDowell. It is called More Learning, Less Activism, Narratives of Childhood in the School Strikes for Climate. Our paper presents a qualitative case study of public commentary surrounding the 2019 School Strikes for Climate as mediated through the news articles. Anticipatory and protectionist themes were common, along with some commentary that discussed children's agency. These findings demonstrate that the strikers were largely not seen as capable citizens. Their actions were not deemed as valid political participation. We argue that children's activism is prefigurative. Their actions implicitly challenge the traditional narratives. Political activism is not just an example of experiential learning. It aligns with the goals of the education system to educate active and informed citizens. By acting prefiguratively, children are at the forefront of creating a new narrative. A narrative which shifts anticipatory discourse from their age and development to the need for societal systems to incorporate their capacity and voice as valid political action. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Jean and I got involved with School Strike for Climate in 2018 and I'm a co-author of this article. Um, School Strike as an organisation is super unique in how it brings young people almost entirely under the age of 18 together to fight for change and as a space that I'd never been involved in anything like before and it was really transformative for me because sure I could learn about climate change pretty easily but this was the first time that I had been able to gain a very sort of unique and distinct education about leadership. Um, and I think that this trust and relationships that I built with Strikers over time allowed for a really fantastic and interesting article and survey because we were able to gain quite an intimate access to the movement and, and talk to other young people to gain really valuable um, data. And so my name is Amanda Tattersall and I'm one of the researchers on the team. And what the article does is ask this question, what is leadership? What is political leadership in the first place? And we go through history and we investigate questions about whether it's from class consciousness or charismatic leadership or parties as leaders or community organizing's approach, which says we've got to build leadership in others, whether leaderless movements play a role, whether there are ladders of engagement, all these different ways in which leadership has been, un has been seen to be developed in the past. And what we ask is, maybe there are actually different pathways to leadership, depending on the different forms of activity that social movements undertake. Hi, my name is Varsha and I'm a co-author of this paper and a former school striker as well. So we investigated three types of leadership, mobilizing, organizing, and playing by the rules. And what I really realized in reflecting on my own time and also looking at the data that we received is school strike for climate really redefines and actually exposes what it means to be a leader. It shows that the people in parliament a lot of the time aren't the true leaders, but people in movements like School Strike for Climate are actually the leaders because they are able to show vulnerability in the conversations that they have and the stories that they share. They show what it means to be an honest, accountable and trusted leader in sticking by the facts and fighting for justice. Hi everybody, welcome to our session. We're presenting our paper, School Strikers Enacting Politics for Climate Justice, Daring to Think Differently About Education. Our paper is a co-authored reflection on the School Strike for Climate experience from an academic and a school strike leader perspective, enabling us to make some claims about the reforms required for education in uncertain futures. We co-authored with the intention of collaborating to ensure each of our voices were heard, even in this academic context. We disrupted the researcher participatory binary. All of us emerged pleased with our activist research. Our paper is important because it helps to convey the urgency of climate action and provide insight into how people can become involved in the movement. And we also explore the diverse implications that climate change can have and our differing experiences and coping with the crisis, which can hopefully bring people a sense of solidarity and hope for the future. 
Articles on the climate crisis and social movements are going to be crucial in reflecting on where we have been and where we have to go. Uplifting voices of youth who are disproportionately going to be affected by the crisis is critical. But with the urgency of climate and people that are being affected every day, the question is where do social movements turn to to make people act and to achieve climate justice? And then how can they be reflected in future academic studies? Thank you, every thank you everyone for listening. Hello, my name is Dr. Benjamin Berman. I'm with my colleague, Dr. Chloe Germain. We published the article, Sustaining the Old World or Imagining a New One, the Transformative Literacies of the Climate Space. We were really interested in the ways in which um, the youth-led climate strike movements were challenging our disciplines uh, to uphold young people's voice, uh, to respect young people's power, and to bear witness to the work that young people are doing around the world on climate change. Well, there's a lot of really fantastic work being done um, from a kind of a youth-centered approach or using work with young people or even co-authorship with young people. Uh, we were really glad of the opportunity to articulate what we thought uh, were some of the challenges uh, that young people's activism poses uh, and continues to pose um, to our uh, disciplines. Because although there is a lot of really good work around, uh, we found our disciplines um, are often still um, resistant or at least unprepared uh, for the, um, the voices, the knowledge uh, and the action of young people. So we were really glad of the opportunity um, to articulate some of those and to speak out on um, in support of youth-centered methods. Uh, so thank you uh, and good luck to all the other authors. Um, we think it's a fantastic special issue and I know that Chloe and I are very grateful to be part of it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karina Menzi Valentine, and this is my research and writing buddy, Miriam Hamm. What inspired our paper was a combination of pride and frustration. Pride as we watched intelligent young Australians articulately state the case for changing circumstances to combat climate change. And frustration as we watched both them and their message be summarily dismissed by politicians and members of the media. What we saw instead was education doing its job. What we saw was educators using the Australian curriculum to produce informed and active citizens. Yeah, and we were even more horrified when these teachers were accused of indoctrinating their students. Like Karina said, we as initial teacher trainers train our teachers to be able to deal with all aspects of the mandate put into the Mapartway Declaration and the Australian curriculum. In our paper, we argue that through an integrated approach, teachers can meet both the basics of literacy and numeracy, but also provide the skills, knowledges needed for global competence and sustainable citizenship. We hope that you enjoy our paper. Hi folks, my name's Hannah Feldman. I'm a research fellow at the Institute for Water Futures at the ANU. And I'm here to talk about my PhD work on motivators to attend a school strike event. I'm not really here to talk through the results of that work, but actually some of the difficulties in how we were enabled to work with the teenagers in this study. Now, in my work, I found it really difficult to work with a diverse cohort of young people. I started out wanting to work with regional, remote schools, and I ended up really over-relying on independent, non-government schools in urban areas. And I know I'm not the only one who's had this issue. So my piece in the Australian Journal of Environmental Education is about these challenges. What do we do when the same students are enabled to collaborate on our research over and over again? And what might that mean for students who are not included? Because in general, despite our best efforts, youth participation is really heavily mediated by adults. Adults choose the research sites. We dictate whether the student population is granted access. We filter which students are enabled to participate, even at the school level. We sign their permission forms. All of these steps, all of these steps are really heavily mediated by adult decision making and not by the young people themselves. We're also really hamstrung on how our non-school networks actually enable us to engage with teenagers. I mean, how many 16 year olds do you know that use Facebook and Twitter? Do you? 
do you have a TikTok? <laughs> These questions can really influence who we're able to research with. And in the end, what it means is that we really need to be cognizant of the missing voices in our work, especially in collections like this issue. We need to be self-reflective. Who's really been enabled to participate? But equally, who hasn't? And what do we do about that? So uh, thanks so much to all our researchers who contributed a video. Hopefully everyone can see from that why Alicia and I are so excited about this collection of research. Uh, what we're going to do next is, oh, sorry, you will have a chance to ask all the authors who are here today a question, but before that, what we're going to do next is to invite Peter, Joe, Neve, Amanda, Jean and Varsha to turn their cameras on. And so you may have noticed in that video, there's two teams in this issue that include academics as well as school strike leaders from Australia as authors on their papers. And so we were pretty excited to have uh, school strikers as co-authors in a research journal and so we have a question for you and the question is pr preceded by the context uh, of um, just recognizing that having young people particularly young activists involved as co-authors on research papers is pretty special and quite unusual. So the question is can you tell us about your experiences conducting this intergenerational activist hyphen academic research and why specifically it was valuable for you. So we might start with Joe, Peter and Neve first and then we'll hear from Jean, Basha and Amanda. Um, I don't know within the teams if you want to decide who goes first um, but I'll let you jump in as feels appropriate. Well, thanks. Maybe I'll have a go um, and then hand over to my team. And apologies, Harriet's not with us today. We were excited about having her with us. Um, I think Joe and I were very enthusiastic about exploring co-researching with, uh, with our young people, but uh, it was tricky, you know, as, as we've heard tonight. So ethically, we, uh, we were confronted by the processes and protocols. We went through the academic institution to ensure that uh, we could proceed. And in the end, it came down to us considering our relationships that we had uh, through networking with Neve and Harriet and how we could respectfully all work together. And so we used an authorship agreement to ensure that we felt we were all um, being involved in this uh, um, coalescing of ideas and this collaborative um, process and output. Uh, maybe Joe, I'll hand to, to you. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then I'll, I'll pass to, to Neve. Um, similar to Peter, I mean, from our from our perspective, Peter and I, that is working within a, a academic institution, this uh, collaborative process has uh, forced us in some ways to reconsider what is what it is to do academic work and what it is to do research. I think um, Hannah mentioned also in a video just then around the challenges of undertaking this research. And I think one of the questions we have to ask is, you know what, what what is research and what constitutes activist research um, and that's really interesting to us as we continue to work with uh, climate strikers uh, moving forward hopefully uh, so I uh, pass to Neve to to um, uh, join the discussion as well yeah I think it was a super exciting opportunity um, to be heard on an equal level um, as a young person um, often the academic world seems like something you have to like enter after doing years and years of university and study. Um, so it was a super exciting opportunity to be heard um, at that level um, and have those kind of deeper discussions um, in our case about education and how that relates to School Strike for Climate and our work um, in climate justice and climate activism. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, Jean, Basha, Amanda, reflections on your experiences writing together? Um, I think it was a, a really interesting and distinct experience because, um, yeah, the world of academia has always felt very, I guess, sort of closed off and inaccessible, especially as young people. Um, so it was really cool to sort of see it from the inside and it kind of felt like in a way we were deconstructing 
those barriers in the first place, like sort of the arbitrariness of them. But I think um, it was really great to use that lens to observe um, a movement like School Strike for Climate, because the way it had grown was so organic and it was young people had often hadn't been involved that much in the past in organizing. So we had help from mentors, we figured things out ourselves, it was sort of all put together. And I think I've never spent the time really looking at it and deconstructing um, how we operate. So it was a really, really interesting lens to look at something that feels so commonplace in my life now. Um, and I think it just felt really great to be seen as an equal and as a researcher um, and to, again, have young voices be elevated and be taken quite seriously in, in this academic context. So, yeah, it, it was a really fantastic experience. I'm really grateful for it. Yeah, and I think just on that, um, everything Jean said, totally agree with, but even for people of color as well, the world of academia, there's just a lot going on there. So I think having this opportunity was incredible, not only as like a young person, but also as a woman of color to be included in this. And I think with discussions about things like climate justice, it's so important to be diverse and like have that element. So yeah, obviously I don't represent everyone, but it was it was an amazing experience to have. Well, it was amazing for me too, as the old person in our trio. Um, like for me, I had sort of grown tired of demonstrations and rallies um, over the years. I'm so old and tired of those sort of things. And the only time that I had been as excited as I was by the student strikers was during the war in Iraq. That's a long time ago. That's when I was still young. And when the, strike, the strikes came along and my kids wanted to go and they're in primary school and I went to the first demo, I've got the picture of the, that first demonstration in my background. I could see that this was something that was this sense of a moment of a generation, that's something that needed to be understood that I wanted to throw myself into. And I feel honoured to be, have been able to do this research not only because I wear the cap of, of being a researcher, but also because I wear the cap of being an organiser. And I worked with Jean and Varsha in trainings and mentoring and sort of we built a relationship as, as people were trying to change the world before we built a relationship with people trying to research how that change occurred. And I think that that was so important and necessary to be able to do this kind of research because we're asking people to overcome quite sort of hierarchical levels of ordinary um, insurmountable levels of lack of trust to be able to build a research team that that can move beyond some of those power hierarchies required a lot of trust for us to build but I'm honored by the relationships the knowledge that I've gained in seeing how this movement is so much more sustainable and dynamic than so many movements that we've seen before and to be able to create and sort of cultivate a space of research action which is going to be needed for this movement to be successful but also I'm just honored to have been part of something that's not just um, enlivening my mind, but you know, warming my heart. So thank you team and thank you to the editors for making it possible. Thank you all so much, amazing. And uh, one of the major themes that Blanche and I were also um, picking up was that young uh, youth climate strikers are very much our educators uh, and the impact that that has had on the school system, but also we're seeing now it disrupting the foundations of academia and what it is to be a researcher, uh, to be a scholar and to work alongside, to, to, look, to work within multi-generational webs, uh, not just leaving it to youth activists, to fix up the mess that adults have made, uh, but very much working in solidarity with each other. So thank you so much, Jean, Harriet, Basha, Neve, Joe, Peter and Amanda for sharing your um, insights into working together there. And now we uh, do invite everybody here uh, to uh, submit your questions to the panel. So any of the authors that are here that you can see in your frame uh, from the Youth Climate Strikers and their uh, colleagues uh, to other authors from this excellent special issue. We already do actually have two questions in there. So we might head over there first to get the ball rolling and then we can open it out to anybody else. Uh, so firstly to Rachel's question um, and feel free to expand on this Rachel if you're there but um, what uh, Rachel has asked and anyone can feel free to respond to this in the panel. Uh, what do educators, school leaders and educational policy makers need to let go of in order to embrace and act on these messages? How do we help them to do this? How can we help educational leaders to be more courageous? So um, put your hand up or just take yourself off mute to any of the authors who want to respond to that excellent question from Rachel. Uh, 
And don't be shy either, Hannah. Yes, jump great. in. Go for it, Hannah. Hey, folks. First of all, congratulations to all of the authors on this uh, collection and to the editors too. This has been so wonderful to be a part of. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to jump into a little bit of Rachel's um, question, but also one that was in the comments about um, basically working with young people and how we can kind of move forward in enabling people. And the, the bit of Rachel's question that stands out to me is educational policymakers. Now, I'm not sure, um, this is Catherine Walker in the chat who asked this question. I'm not sure what other people's experiences have been. But for me, the, the biggest roadblocks have really been with state um, education departments. Um, you know, there are some very important things that are set up to protect school students and to stop um, teachers being completely overwhelmed by research requests and so on. Um, but this was the area that I found the least conversation was open around what's actually the problem here with, with you know, working with young people. At the kind of school level, I had a lot of teachers and students who were really keen. The university was really supportive as well. Um, but there was this kind of middleman situation set up where it was a very kind of black box for me. The process of what was going on there wasn't particularly clear. And so I think, you know, in, in all of these kind of scenarios, open communication is really, really important. And that's an area that I see a lot of growth um, that we could make in kind of really cracking open that black box and having a look at the kinds of governing processes that happen in the background. Because as I said in my video, as much as we can kind of try and empower other voices and for us to sit back and, and you know, enable that space, if there's all this decision making happening behind a closed door, there's going to be a disconnect with how much those um, people are enabled. So, uh, yeah, happy to kick off the discussion with those comments. Thanks so much, Hannah. Does anyone else want to jump in on that sort of around the question of what education policy or education leaders can do. And I'm wondering if one of our school strikers has a reflection on this as well. I know it might be a seemingly big question for you, but um, I know you're also very savvy people and, and know what you want to see more of and less of in the schools. So anyone else want to jump in on that one? I could um, perhaps just share a quote which really resonated with me from a global confidence forum that was recently held in the UAE. And the speaker was from the teachers union in Singapore. And they said, you can't have student agency until you have teacher agency. And I think that really builds on Hannah's point until the teachers start to feel supported in taking risks, encouraging student voice then you're not going to get the student voice at the other end. I think that's a really interesting point. Thanks, Karina. And we did um, we did have one paper that was being considered for publication in this issue uh, that eventually the authors pulled out um, due to concerns over how um, some of those authors who were teacher graduates, so just starting teaching, um, how they would be perceived and their job possibilities in the petro state that they were um, teaching and researching in. So unfortunately that paper didn't see it to publication, but it does really reinforce the kinds of uh, very intense politics surrounding some of what's happening around climate change in schools um, and that the teachers often feel really not only unsupported, but actively um, attacked for what they're trying to do. So thanks, Karina. Um, does anyone else want to jump in on that question? Because it is a big question. There's lots of angles to it. So thanks, Rachel, for asking. Yeah. I don't want to monopolise this too much, but just to reflect on your statement, Blanche, that was also really reflected by the students in my work, is that everyone is aware of this, you know, that, that teachers are put in a really difficult position. Yeah. Sorry, thanks no. so much for that reflection, Hannah. Absolutely. Um, so we do have some other questions, but... Um, uh, feel free to respond back to that question as well or we'll weave that in. So uh, the second question from Eve Mays in the Q&A there, what an amazing collection of papers. Thank you. Do the authors who are actively involved in climate justice activism, all ages, see academic research writing as useful for their climate justice work? If so, hopefully, why and how? What kinds or forms of research and writing are most useful? And can I just add, this is a question I have for our school strikers as well, just to add to that. You're incredibly um, talented and busy people who are finding a voice for yourselves in lots of kinds of avenues. 
Um, writing a research paper takes, as you've learned, a, a lot of time. So I'd love to know why you felt that, that was useful and a valuable use of your energy and time, just to add to that. Um, well, if, uh, I'm so happy to speak to that in the sense that I think it was really important to reflect on actually like the writing process of it, because obviously so much goes into it. And that is probably something that I still can't fully comprehend. Amanda was amazing in walking us through that. Um, but it was really interesting to realize that something that became so organic and almost innate, like, you know, you jump on a school strike meeting, you'd go to a protest, those kinds of things had just kind of become part of our lives. Um, and realizing that there's leadership styles, there's all these elements to it. That was quite incredible. And then also it's been a while since we've actually like written these papers and started writing um, and realizing all the shifts in the climate movement since then as well. Like when we talk about words like justice, when we talk about what being a leader means, it's not really the, tr the traditional idea of a parliamentarian anymore. Like that's not what comes to my mind. I don't see those people as leaders who I see leaders as like people that I actually, got to do work with in school strike or like my family who are able to have conversations about vulnerability and honesty and what those things mean so I think for me being part of that process really just changed my perception of what kind of impact school strike had in my life and then also what leadership means as well Excellent. Thank you, Vasha, for those insights and responses. And, um, you know, another crisis that happened in the process of writing and collating these was the COVID pandemic. So for two years, uh, we are very conscious of the amount of work and uh, labour that went into curating um, and cultivating these relationships, authorial relationships, as well as the articles themselves in that context. I think, Jean, did you want to jump in and respond to that as well? Yeah. Um I think it's like academia in the sense is a really um, effective way of being able to ref as, a, as a form of reflection and observing like quite closely analyzing how a movement like school strike for climate is built and then being able to convert that into a learning resource. Because um, I think as long as something is accessibly written and young people are able to gain access to it and I, not even just young people, people of all ages involved within activism. Um, seeing what works and what doesn't and strategies and tactics we may use that other groups and movements and organizations don't. I think that it's a really, really great way of doing that um, quite officially and having that written down in quite a sort of systemized manner. Um, and yeah, I, I think that also for people within the movement, being able to look at it and see what works, seeing how we operate is really useful. Um, and we can continue to channel that and as a movement see um, these sort of pillars, I guess, that are holding us up and continue to operate around those and, and design um, our strategies and tactics um, around those sort of principles, I guess. Um, and I think also, I just wanted to touch really briefly before what we were talking about with educators. I think a, a big thing that's difficult is that um, idea that climate change is inherently a political issue and not a matter of science um, and that by discussing the political side of it in terms of policy um, you're then making it a political issue and it is partisan so it's it is um, sort of on a curriculum level and, and the way that teachers are supported they're not allowed to facilitate conversation um, or aren't supported in facilitating conversation about a very notable issue in our lives because I, I think that in geography for example I remember talking ab about poverty and housing and we look at policies that work and didn't but for some reason climate change is seen as this issue which cannot be touched because it is too active and there's too much loaded with it which is really unfortunate. Uh, Jean thank you so much for those incredible insights and uh summing up this academic contribution as pedagogical as a learning resource itself is like the ultimate praise and the ultimate uh, kind of aim for academics and the reason for this launch to get it out there to actually uh, enact this in our schools in our societies in our communities not just keep it on online you know in um, an academic journal so that's incredible praise uh, for this work and I and I really hope that that's where the, uh, the capacity to make change 
lasting in both academia and school education is by these by by enacting it by the processes that we engage in by bothering to develop those relationships and take the time of cultivating uh, working very differently on all levels so thanks so much for those wonderful insights um, I think a couple of those questions uh, the subsequent questions actually you touched on so I'm just going to go to that uh, last question now and that may be the last one um, before we uh, um, uh, head off and 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 conclude for the evening but um, I did want to open up to if I some panelists haven't had a say yet uh, or others to think about this final uh, question and, the, and it's multi-layered. So thank you for putting together this fantastic activist academic work. So far we have had some one uh, school strike for climate events organised per year. I think a few more than that, then the climate strikers can uh, uh, verify that. Um, so firstly, do you see these becoming more regular from now on, now that we're back out of pandemics? Secondly, what kind of support would the students, sorry, I just lost that. Would the students need from their educators, teachers, and parents? And three, what about having regular youth climate fairs and festivals as you would have, uh, for example, science fairs? So thanks for that question, Bruna. Um, I'm gonna open up, obviously, some of those pertain specifically to the climate strikers, but um, feel free for any of the other authors or panelists to respond to any of those parts of that question. Um, and just before we do that, thanks, Alicia. I might just add to that Philippa's question, uh, which is also mentioning around how we suggested one of the common themes was the need to reimagine education. And Philippa's wondering um, if some Sorry. of the authors yeah. could comment on what that means for them and how they'd like to see education reimagined as a similar kind of question, but just to right. acknowledge, thanks, Philippa, for that. Um, I'll start with School Strike for Climate has a lot planned for this year. Um, first off, we have our next big strike this Friday, March 25th, um, but also lots of election actions as we approach an extremely important election and we want to put climate justice on the agenda um, and get momentum rolling for the rest of the year um, as we prepare to get bigger and bigger um, and deeper in our organizing work. Um, and touching on like, the education side of it, I think like the support and the solidarity we want um, from people out there is to shop and stand in solidarity, solidarity with us like at our strikes um, and give us the support and resources we need to create these, but also learn about like the issues of climate justice and why, you know, climate change is so much more than the science um, and has so many deeper consequential like um, relations to society and how society functions currently um, and how those interrelate. And I think that's a super um, important topic that often isn't touched on um, when talking about science, uh, talking about climate change and education. Um, often it's very much science focused if it is touched on um, at schools. And so bringing kind of that societal justice aspect to it, I think is super, super critical. Thanks so much, Nini. Um, oh, Amanda. I was yes. just going to say, uh, one of the things that came up in our paper was that we didn't just look at strikes as the only form of action that is occurring within in Student Strike for Climate. Like, there's actually an enormous amount of activity that occurred during COVID that was incredibly powerful, but maybe out of view of adults. Lots of training, online training, lots of mentoring and support, learning about how to do forms of action. And I just say, let's just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not powerful what we found was that that was this kind of activity that was really nourishing and support supporting a grassroots sustainable movement that didn't really need much informal ngo support and so and i and i think that there's real wisdom in not just measuring or tr treating as important the protests the protests have a place but all these other forms of action activity at a school level in the regions coalitions with other organizations they're all rich and we might not see them but just just to lift up how important that is and has been and it's sort of critical to why the strikers have been so successful and sustained over so many years yeah, amazing insights, Amanda. Thank you so much for that. Um, there is a lot of stuff, as Amanda said, that has been happening online through COVID, not necessarily on the streets, but uh, again, to, not to sound patronising, but I think there is an incredible amount that adult activists and academics can learn from how young people have done these climate 
strikes and organise them so incredibly over time uh, and in between the massive strike movement. So I think um, sustaining uh, activism um, and commitment in so many different ways and reaching out and making relationships and building a vast uh, suite of resources is is quite phenomenal uh, so um, it's an yeah it's we're really honored to be amongst such incredible leaders okay so over to you Blanche but I think that's probably all uh, we have time for um, unless there are any burning final questions from anyone in the Q&A or the chat. And yeah, just a few questions about the recording of this, if, if you were re uh, registered, which you are, as um, people have commented on the chat, the re recording of this uh, session tonight will be sent to you. Thanks, Alicia. Um, and I don't wanna undermine your timekeeping, but I think we have a few more minutes. Um, oh, sorry, I'm seeing 5.56. I, I think there was chocolate on my... Uh, <laughs> clock here <laughs> That's it. but um just yeah it is uh we've got about eight minutes left so if uh anyone on the panel would like to respond to some of the questions that are being asked already and you haven't had a chance to speak today yet we'd love to hear from you um equally if you have already had something to say but you've got something else to contribute to the discussion please go for it um you know we're here right now so yeah Jaden, we'd love to hear from you yeah, hi. Um, I actually wanted to go back to an earlier question about sort of the importance of writing and researching about the climate strikes and sort of how that can contribute. And at least in Canada, um, what I have done since my master's degree where I researched the strikes is I've actually gone into law school and I've come to learn just how important a lot of academic research and writing is in the formulation of laws. Um, in how like the legal system and the justice system in the common law world looks at academic research um, and academic understandings of certain principles when they're formulating laws, um, when doing research about how to move forward on a certain issue. So I think it's really important a lot of the work that everyone here has been writing about in terms of how our legal systems are going to move forward when talking about environmental rights, human rights, climate justice, and a lot of other key issues, and even perhaps in in form formulating new education policies. Um, if there's a lot of research about the importance of these principles, then there's something for the new policies to be relied upon. So I think a lot of the work that's being done around climate strikes and climate justice in this, in this arena is, is able to contribute a lot uh, to future policy developments. Thank you, Jaden. And thanks for being so articulate at uh, nearly 2 a.m. your time. Um, Anyone else want to jump in before we head off for the evening or morning, wherever you are? I'd like to just say from all of us to, to Blanche and Alicia and Peter, thank you so much for pulling this together. It's been so wonderful to connect with other researchers in this area and with students in this area. Um, it's just been a really powerful process for all of us. So. You know, I'm, I'm aware of how much work goes into pulling these things together and you, you three have really knocked it out of the park. So thank you so much from us too. Thank you, Hannah. Okay, well, uh, I know <laughs> I know many of our strikers have uh, other meetings to go to at six to organise more activist stuff. So we might give them a five minute breather <laughs> and uh, wrap it up early. Uh, thanks so much to everyone who's come along to the session tonight. We really appreciate your time and attention as well. And yeah, once again, a huge thanks to everyone involved, both at the journal, the authors, um, and you know, especially our school strikers, not just for contributing to the research, but also all the activism that forms the inspiration for this as well. So yeah, thanks so much. And uh, we hope to see all of you at a strike somewhere this weekend. Hopefully that's COVID safe and weather safe as well for you. I think we're looking at a lot of rain here in Sydney. So fingers crossed that that works out um yeah yes. so the, the transcript of the chat should be um there as well so there's a lot of links there and peter thank you so much for putting up the link to the issue that's really exciting uh they are available and out there in the world uh, keep doing the great work folks and i look forward to working with you again uh, in the future this is really just the beginning hey um so keep it up 
keep the momentum, keep building those incredible relationships across generations uh, and fighting for climate justice, education as climate justice education. So thank you all for joining us tonight and people in the audience for your excellent uh, contributions and questions. Uh, thanks and take care, everybody.